Welcome back to the report. Now, this week, the UN Security Council demanded that humanitarian access to the Palestinian refugee camp Yarmouk in Damascus be allowed following intense battles between Palestinian rebel and government forces against the Islamic State group. This followed the incursion by Islamic State last Wednesday. One UN official described the situation as beyond inhumane. Afzal Ahmed has more on this. It's nearly a week since the Islamic State group entered the Yarmouk district in the Syrian capital of Damascus, where thousands of Palestinian refugees are trapped. Recent estimates say 90% of the area is now under their control. The battle still rages on, however, with Palestinian and other rebel forces fighting the group. Accusations are floated widely around, including from the UN, that the Nusra Front, who is opposed to IS, allowed the group to come in and even aided them. But the group in a statement say they're neutral in the clashes. This allegedly after a reconciliation deal between the Palestinian rebel groups and Syrian government forces to put a halt to the fighting was about to be reached. Whatever the intricacies, the Syrian government, who've laid a devastating siege to the district for nearly two years, have begun assisting the rebel groups with artillery support. They've also started giving safe passage to refugees fleeing the clashes, situating them in a school outside the camp. Some of the victims here described their experiences. We heard that they were breaking walls and there were clashes. We didn't know anything. When IS came closer, we were told they were killing women and children. When the Syrian army entered, they moved us all to another venue where we were safe. We couldn't see them, but we heard that they're beheading all young men. IS called civilians from the mosques to leave the camp, but we didn't believe them because we heard that they killed some people who left. For those still left in the camp, it's a dire scenario. They're now caught between the guns of the opposing rebel forces and the ever-familiar aerial shells of the regime. Many in the camp are now calling to the Palestinian counterparts for help. But from the response from the Palestinian authorities, it seems not much can be done now. We suffered enough as Palestinians, including Palestine refugees, in many uh, countries, including in Syria, and we are not involved in the internal conflict in Syria because we suffered enough and we don't want to suffer more. That has been, you know, the official policy of the Palestinian side, and we were appealing to all parties, government and opposition, not to get our people involved and to add more agonies to their ongoing tragedy. The United Nations expressed deep concern over the situation in Yarmouk, calling for humanitarian aid to be allowed through to help the civilians. They've described the conditions at the camp as beyond inhumane. Members of the Security Council expressed deep concern regarding the grave situation in Yarmouk camp, the refugee camp in Syria. The members condemned in the strongest terms the grave crimes committed by Daesh and Jubhat al-Nusra against 18,000 civilians in the camp and emphasized the need that such crimes do not go unpunished. The Yamuk refugee camp is the biggest Palestinian refugee camp in Syria and was established in the 1950s. It was home to half a million Palestinians before the conflict began in 2011. The camp has now become the most dangerous region in the capital since the start of the civil war. This owing to the fact that it's within a few kilometers away from President Assad's palace, the prize long sought by the rebels. For the residents trapped for now, the situation is only expected to get worse. Hafsal Ahmed, The Report. Well, rejoining me on Skype to discuss this is Mamoun Al Abbasi, news editor at Middle East Eye website, and an activist from Yamuk who's asked us to call him by his an alias, Abdullah Yamuki. Abdullah Yamuki, let me start with you. I mean, the, the Palestinian rebel groups are against the regime of President Bashar al Assad, so is IS. Why are they fighting each other? Well, uh, Palestinians who are 
opposing al-Assad are part of the uh, general Syrian free army. And those members who are Palestinians in the free army, Syrian army, they're just happening to be in their area, which is Yarmouk camp. While there is no specific Palestinian or independent or separate Palestinian group by itself declaring opposition to Assad, but it's within the main opposition uh, armed, armed groups. However, ISIS is a group that is not accepting anyone. It's so radical. They don't have even any policy of negotiating with anyone else. They want to impose their point of view, and they're using extreme measures, by be like beheading people, kidnapping girls, uh, this just annihilating everybody in their way. So there is no way for the and they're from outside their area, so there is no way for those people to live them inside. I mean, I was myself in Damascus a few weeks ago and talking to residents from Yarmouk, and at that time the story was that some of the Jabhat al-Nusra people had yeah. sort of changed their loyalty and said, we now are loyal to Islamic State, so that it wasn't so much new fighters coming in, but the fighters who were already there saying that they now were obedient to IS. Is, is, is there some truth in that as far as you know? Yes, that's, that's the situation actually, and it's to everybody's surprise on the ground for opposition groups to find al-Nusra just coordinating and facilitating and even using the banners of al-Nusra to infiltrate inside Yarmouk and deceive everybody and surprise the, the other groups. And actually they're, they're terrifying terrifying civilians who are trapped and and and, and uh, punished by, by ISIS, which is true. And uh, that was a sudden change for everybody on the ground. And what about the, the government forces? Are they taking advantage, as it were, of this? Uh, and are they attacking the camp um, more than they have done in the past? What, what well, is the government doing? Well, absolutely, that's the case. Absolutely, that's the case. The government is just continued to, to bombard the camp with barrels. And and within an, an hour yesterday, there were eight barrels in, 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 a, in, a, in an hour's time. And and uh, these barrels fall on the civilians' houses, and they're not even hitting any of the armed personnel who, who managed to hide, and they know how to hide. And the, the government is using every advantage of the situation. And instead of trying to ease this the, the siege on the camp, which was imposed more than 700 days ago. Well, Mamoun al -Abbasi, let me let me turn to you. I mean, what should, what can the outside world do about this to stop this uh, tragedy? <laughs> um, it, they should do what they should be doing to stop all tragedy in, in, in Syria and perhaps uh, pressure Russia or make a deal with Russia uh, and and Iran to um, exert its influence on Assad to act more, you know, le less barbaric, barbarically or maybe more humanely, which, whichever way you put it, uh, to solve the problem. In in terms of Yarmouk, I'd just like to highlight that we've been reporting about this for a while. You yourself wrote an article about it for a while. And we were screaming at, at least almost 200 people were starved to death because of the government siege. And only now the international community in Spain a great attention because ISIS entered into the game. So this is, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's one way that should help the, now highlight the plight of the people of Yarmouk uh, because because ISIS is now is, is there. Um, to, to also to address some of your earlier questions, um, ISIS prior to the American uh, intervention had hardly ever engaged with the regime. It, it always engages with rebel groups. Even now, when, when it filtered into Yarmouk, it, it never aimed to take on the regime. It's right on the, on, in Damascus, and yet its main target are other rebels. With al-Nusra, it's not clear. You have to remember these groups, most, most groups in, uh, in Syria, they don't have a good coordination together. So you have one group that's called al-Nusra in Yarmouk, might act independently from al-Nusra somewhere else. They're, they're not that tied in. Uh, with with a proper chain of command as an uh, as an army is, um, there are rumours that uh, uh, um, there was potential some sort of a ceasefire deal where the Nusra people thought they could you know be handed over to the regime and hence allowed ISIS people. But again, all of that is just speculation. 
Well, let me come back to you, Abdullah Yamuki. I mean, the civilians, of course, are trapped in this. We've just seen in the clip that some women and children were allowed out. I mean, is there any idea of the numbers? I mean, terrible though it is, it is better to be outside Yamuk than inside. So, so there is some uh, opportunity for people to get out. They're not under total siege. Well, there is a way, if the regime wanted, they can even facilitate lots of, uh, uh, in a lots, in lots of ways for people to leave. For casualties, for just last night, for from the burn, there were at least four people killed and about 20 injured, and there is no way for even to treat them. There is no even the field medical hospital that is used that used to be. Uh, operational, stopped operational, and it's now in, in the uh, uh, right of uh, of the camp. And uh, of course, lots of families uh, fled towards the the, the eastern side of the, of the camp to Yelda area, and 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 not, nothing is reaching them. By the way, a few things from uh, Sark, but uh, no 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 apparent assistance because. Guess what? They're waiting for government approval for some of the families to be admitted into the masters, because those people need to be screened by security checks, and uh, and that, these measures are even makes it even more terrifying for the people to who are fleeing. Because I mean, for th for three months between December and March, there was a complete black uh, out on aid going in. The UN desperately was trying to get stuff in, and for three months they were forbidden. Then in March. Some aid did start going back in. What, what's the situation now? Is the UN able to deliver any aid at all now inside Yamuk? Not at all. Not at all whatsoever. It's, it's, again, there is no, no aid coming in. Uh, the UN, all agencies, UNRWA, UNHCR, ICRC, and all these people who are not, not influencing, they're not able to influence any, any, anything on, uh, on the ground, and the regime is so, uh, so stubborn. and. And I think I fully agree with Mamoun. I think it's politically should be politically solved. And the, and the big actors, the Russians and the Iranians, who are having the say on the ground at the moment, and I don't think anymore is is the, the the regime forces. Well, Mamoun, we we're coming to the end. Let me just ask you on that same point about the politics. You mentioned Russia and Iran should put pressure on uh, President Assad. What about the other side? Will the um, Opposition forces, the Free Syrian Army and the others, show, be willing at all to any kind of compromise that uh, on the lines of the Geneva Agreement uh, that uh, was was on the ground about two months, two years ago, three years ago. Well, I think the the original Geneva Agreement, which uh, Russia agreed to, says eventually Assad must must step down. Um, and I think it's after that much bloodshed. I don't. I don't see another way. You would have. You would have uh, members of the of the regime, with some members of the opposition, um, in a transitional phase until th there's some sort of uh, elections. But as you see, the the regime is not. The regime does not recognize any opposition. Um, if they're abroad, they are Western backed. If they are inside the country, they're terrorists. The only opposition he recognizes are the ones who are in his favor in Damascus. So he's only talking to himself. The regime only talks to itself. Uh, on the other side, you have many, many factions, but all of them, if, if there is a, if there's a, a promise that things would be uh, better, then all of those radical elements w would be forsaken. Remember, radicalism grows when there's desperation. When there are things it drives you to that, but when 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 there is hope, radicalism diminishes. So there there is no other option than than uh, a negotiated settlement, but not not the one where Assad dictates all the terms. And it's like after all those two hundred thousand dead, God knows more um, disappeared, and he still remains in power as if nothing has changed. Well, on that note, uh, we'll have to end. Thank you very much, Abdullah Yamuki and Mamun Alabasi. Now, moving on to our final story tonight, police are investigating the death of a man in London following suspected murder. The man who is believed to be Syrian-born, Abdul Hadi Awani, was 55 years old and a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's thought to have been shot in the chest. Friends of Sheikh Awani told Islam Channel he had complained of suspicious events occurring before this morning's incident. The Muslim Brotherhood have confirmed the story but declined to comment further. 
the Islam Channel will be following this story as it develops. Now, let's turn to our final story of the evening. The former head of the British National Counterterrorism Security Office has this week accused the coalition government's reduction in prison staff as being a contributing factor in the radicalization of prisoners. But how significant is his claim, and does it address the real roots of radicalization? Adama Munu looks into this issue. The debate on what gives rise to radicalisation in prison has taken a new turn as staff shortages is attributed to what is seen as a growing problem. Recently, there has been much attention given to schools and mosques as possible breeding grounds for radicalisation, but this week the attention has come back to prisons. Former head of the National Counter-Terrorism Security Office, Chris Phillips, does not seem to think so, warning staff shortages mean that those he describes as extremists are not being properly monitored, allowing them to, as he described, recruit others. These statements echo findings in a report called the Prisons and Terrorism Radicalization and Deradicalization in 50 Countries, which stated that overcrowding and understaffing amplify the conditions that lend themselves to radicalization, where extremist recruiters can operate at free will and monopolize the discourse about religion and politics. The Justice Department denies these claims, stating that prison overcrowding has been at its lowest level for a decade, adding that the former chief inspector left the civil service four years ago. But there have been significant cuts to the prison sector under the coalition government. The numbers of prison officers have been reduced by 30%. Instead, the government believes more targeted and robust measures are needed to tackle radicalisation head-on, with the use of what they call extremism officers and the use of faith intervention teams. Both Phillips and the government take on different analyses into the risk of radicalisation. However, the key question that remains to be answered is what actually pulls inmates to views perceived to be radical. Adam Amunu, The Report. Well, joining me on the line to discuss this is Dr. Muzamil Qureshi, who is Senior Lecturer in Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Salford. And he's been researching issues of Muslim populations' victimization and crime for over 18 years. Welcome to the programme. Dr. Qureshi, I mean, do you support what uh, Chris Phillips says? Do you um, think he's right? I, I think there's a danger here of conflating some issues. Um, in terms of the cuts which are affecting criminal justice, there are some vulnerabilities there, and they apply to risks which are not just those of uh, radicalization or extremism, but also general matters of um, welfare within prison. But it, it does seem to tap into a contrast here between media, government, prison service anxiety, and what academics have been studying about um, Muslims in prison. And also um, that uh, body of literature, or a uh, significant body of literature, seems to be more restrained in terms of its um, findings on links between the prisoner state and radicalization. I mean, it's often been said that in prison, prison is the great sort of university because you have a lot of people there who have a lot of time on their hands and not much to do, and they read and they study and they talk and they think. Uh, so isn't it, uh, by definition, prison actually a good environment for, for radicalization? Um, well, we, I think there are a number of complex issues which are interrelated here. One is that in, in Britain, we have for the last 10 or 15 years seen a institutionalization of Islam in prison. And that's based on increased securitization. So we have, you know, established vetting and uh, regulation in prisons. I, I say this with some caveats because, one, there is a question as to whether academic research lags behind um, the, the, the physical environment. But I am still privy to what's going on through, through um, working as an advisor and also various research uh, students that are doing work currently in the prison estate. Um, so there is one caveat there to say, well, academia may be lagging behind. But nevertheless, the British um, uh, system and the prison service have regulated and vetted Muslims for a number of years now. And uh, it's led to an institutionalized interpretation of Islam and also uh, an established system of, of uh, checking on what's going on in terms of people who are recruited as imams or Muslim chaplains as well as uh, the practices in, of, of the individuals in prison. 
So I think there is a danger of exaggeration there in terms of the risk. Well, I mean, I thought that because of the cuts in staff, prisoners are spending much more time in their cells and uh, possibly in solitary confinement. Therefore, the chance of meeting other prisoners is actually reduced, isn't there? That's, that's one interpretation. The other issue is that uh, in terms of the cuts, um, you know, you will get resources which, which are there for uh, support and welfare. And I think the other side of the coin is to look at the way, in fact, that Muslim populations are indeed discriminated in prisons. So there is, there is an issue here in terms of looking at those issues uh, which, which could lead to isolation. Well, can there you explain studies... that? I mean, what, in what way are they discriminated in prison? Oh, there's, there's, there's significant research, both from the Inspectorate of Prisons and independent uh, qualitative research, which shows that Muslim prisoners are, are discriminated both on grounds of their religion and often their ethnicity because they all, these intersect in prison, um, both in terms of traditional experiences of access to uh, material, prayer, halal, halal food. Not to deny that all these things are provided, um, but there's perceptions, there's perceptions of, of uh, access to these religious rights as well. Um, in terms of the fact of conversion, which is often also thrown into the mix as well, that we have a prison uh, estate, a Muslim population that doesn't quite map on to the broader Muslim population in, uh, in, in British society. So there is evidence of conversion, but conversion is often equated with uh, a vulnerability or, or um, radicalization, but it's not, it shouldn't be equated uh, as a vulnerability. Often um, people convert it, uh, provide them with some order and some meaning for their lives, which are often very disorderly. Well, thank you very much for that. Um... Dr. Kureshi, we'll have to end it there because that's all we've got time for on this episode of The Report. I want to thank all my guests on today's show and thank you at home for watching. Do remember that you can keep up with us on Twitter by following at Islam Channel by using hashtag The Report. But for now, we'll leave you with some footage of the moment when the crew of the conservation group Sea Shepherd rescued fishermen from a sinking vessel they'd been pursuing for four months for suspected illegal fishing before it sank about 100 nautical miles off the west coast of Sao Tome. We'll be back tomorrow, so do join us then. Good night.